is the Arabian Ministries uh, Sunday afternoon traditional worship service that we have every Sunday afternoon, 4.30 to 5.30 on uh, Eastern Standard Time. And we welcome everybody here in person, but also we have folks that have joined us live stream. And uh, may the Lord bless our time together today. I'm going to ask Jim, one of our missionaries, to give us our call of worship, and then I'm going to ask uh, Michael if he would lead us in a word of invocation. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done, sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Amen. Thank you. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, the flower fades and the grass withers. But the word of God shall stand forever. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Okay, so, uh, Michael, how about praying a prayer of invocation? Father, I think this afternoon with all those who maybe can't be here for whatever reason and couldn't log on and they're hurting, Father. That there are souls that are broken and needing you, Father. It's funny, if we're quiet for any length of time, we start hearing the cry of this world and, and the, the, the grief and the pain of wars and the rumors of wars and people treating each other so vile and so terrible, Lord. But you are our King, you are our God, and, and your word that Jim just, Jim just read, it says, for me to rejoice. And I think of the song that says, how can I rejoice in a, in a strange land? And, and the truth is, you have told us to lift up your name and to praise you, Father, and to worship you and you alone. That you are our King, you are my God. And I will rejoice, not because of this world, but because of you and who you are. Lord, I ask that you open our hearts this afternoon, that you open our minds, but most of all, you open our spirits, Lord, that we would hear you have to say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Okay, Russell, what do we got for us? Well, in the Word of God, as set down by the Apostle Paul in Romans, says, While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And our theme, Him, as always, is and can it be on page 346.
just thank you again for your finished work on the cross. We thank you for allowing us to be in this wonderful, wonderful chapel on the campus of Old Covenant Presbyterian Church. And we pray for our host church, Old Covenant Presbyterian, and the entire congregation, and all the listeners and their families on the internet and people here today. Lord God, God bless these tithes that are coming today from the congregation and also from the individuals who are watching this uh, on, on the internet. Lord, we thank you so much for your allowing us to have this incredible technology where here in Miami, Florida, we can reach forth to all parts of the world and tell of your glorious, glorious sacrifice and our victory in you, in Jesus Christ. We thank you for all this. And ask you for all your all the blessings you bestow on all of our families and friends and individuals that come to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, well, we're going to sing in just a minute. Uh, I love to tell the story, but I want to tell a story about telling the story. Uh, this uh, we're, we're meeting at the Davis Chapel, which is on the beautiful campus of Old Color Presbyterian Church in Palmetto Bay, Florida. And uh, Old Color has been very gracious. They have allowed us to uh, start and use their facilities here at Old Color for a number of years. Uh, I was a, I've been a missionary with, uh, a sponsored missionary with Old Color for many, many years. Back before I was with the Live Again, I was with uh, an organization called Ministries in Action. And so I've been coming to the Missions Festival. Every year they have this incredible Missions Festival. It's a, a week-long deal, and uh, it's just an incredible focus on spreading the gospel, uh, not only here in Miami, but uh, throughout the world. And uh, they sponsor a lot of missionaries. And uh, so about 30 years ago, about 30 years ago, uh, we, uh, we were having one of these missions conferences here. And uh, this is when I was, I was based overseas. I was living in Jamaica and I came up here for the missions conference. And uh, I was assigned to go and speak to a large Sunday school class. The Sunday school class, there must have been 30 or 40 people in the Sunday school class. And there were two of us, uh, this guy named Victor, uh, who was, he was with Miami Rescue Mission. He was the assistant director of the Miami Rescue Mission. And, uh, and myself, and we were assigned to go and, you know, share our mission and ministry at the, uh, at the Sunday school class. And uh, so I get up and I do my thing, and then Victor gets up and he tells how, he said, you know, uh, he said, I, uh, I'm now the assistant director at my rescue mission, he said, but uh, I want to tell you the story of how I got here. He said, I grew up in Jamaica, and he said, uh, typically, you know, growing up in Jamaica, I attended church when I was a little boy. He said, but by the time I got to be a teenager, church just wasn't important to me. He said, I stopped going to church. He said, and, uh, you know, one thing led to another. He said, and I had the privilege and, and uh, pleasure of coming to, to do my, uh, academic college studies here in the States, and he said, when I graduated, I got a really good job at one of the airline companies. And he said, uh, he said, and one day, he said, I, you know, I've been working for the airline for a couple of years, and he said, one day I was flying, I was deadheading. Uh, I was, I needed to be in Miami, but I had been over in the West Coast, and so I got a free ride on one of the uh, uh, airline carriers. It wasn't the airline carrier that I worked for, but you know, I had a deal where you know you could fly for free if you were work for the airlines. So he said I was flying on a on a different airline than what I worked for. He said he said if we were flying across the state of Florida, he said the pilot comes on. He says, ladies and gentlemen, we're so glad that you decided to fly such and such an airline today. We know you had choices, but uh, we're glad that you chose us and. Uh, I want you to look out your window and see something the most beautiful thing on God's green earth. He said it's called the Everglades National Park. So Victor says, he looks out the window, he said he had never bothered to look out the window flying over the Everglades, and he said he was awestruck by this incredible, and then he said he stopped and he thought, 
Did that pilot just say God? He, he just said God's green earth. So Victor said he was sitting there and he said, I hadn't thought about God for a long, long time. He you know, said I was thinking about making money, I was thinking about women, I was thinking about everything but God. And he said, but that pilot said, and God's green earth. So he said, you know, he's sitting there chewing on this and he hadn't thought about God for a long time. He said, and uh, so <clears throat> he said they landed in the beautiful landing and everybody clapped, you know, I'm so glad that we landed and then crashed. And he said, as we were getting off the airline, the pilot came on and he said, ladies and gentlemen, we're so glad that you chose to fly our airline, whatever it was, today. And he said, as you deplane, deplane, I want you to remember this is the day the Lord has made rejoice and be glad in it. Victor said, God used that to change his life. He said that, in, you know, 10 or 15 years prior to his being there that Sunday, he said, God used that to change his life because he was going in one direction, but God used this pilot that he didn't know, he had no idea who this guy was, to change his life to cause him to start thinking about God and having a right relationship with God. And he grew up knowing about who Jesus was, but it reminded him. So I saw, and I was sitting there, and I, I knew exactly what was about to happen. I saw this hand go up in the back of the, in the back of the classroom. And this guy named Roy Berube, he raised his hand, he said, Victor, he said, my name's Roy Berube, and I'm the pilot that was flying that thing. I love to tell the story. I, 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 I was going to say the reason I was looking at this that I know who that pilot was. Yeah. And so, and so Victor goes, you know, I want to thank you because God used you to change my life, change the course of my life. He said, but I do have a question for you. He said, did, did the airlines, did they fire you for talking about God? And uh, Roy said, well, you know, sometimes they'd give me a hard time or other, but you know what? It was the right thing to do, so I kept doing it. Cool. There you go, I'd love to tell the story. What number is it, Russell? Well, it's our next tab. Oh, yeah. oh, is that? Yeah. Oh, 44. Oh, no, that's not it. Okay, okay. Our next tab is 444. No, oh, and it's not a slide. And it's, oh. all, it's at our bulletin. Whoa, so wait a second. Bulletin. I got a. It's all on the it's back side of the bulletin. Bulletin. Straight is the gate and narrow. 
suffered uh, as a child. He had, what is that thing, spinal bifida. bifida. He had that and uh, went through a lot of pain and agony in his life. But by the time he was a teenager, he had, his, life, his uh, mother had given him a good part and he became uh, an incredible songwriter, an incredible musician. And uh, in 1947, the year I was born, he wrote this song, I Saw the Light. Uh, now, poor Hank, he wrestled with alcoholism and drug abuse his whole life. And uh, this song was uh, a song that he, he would close every one of his concerts with because he knew he was in trouble, and this was his song of hopeful redemption. Amen. Okay, so my next song, well, first of all, I've got, I've got to tell you, I'm a hemaholic. I am a professed hemaholic. And I used to say that this is my favorite gym. But unfortunately, I heard a thing today, you know, that uh, it was, uh, God will take care of you. I said, no, this is my favorite gym. And then I was hearing, here are my God, I said, no, that's my favorite gym. So, uh, so this used to be my favorite gym, but. That's kind of like when Satan goes through the list of uh, seven deadly sins, he goes, adultery, that's my favorite sin. And then he sees pride, no, no, that's my favorite sin. But it's better to be one who's a demo hall. Okay, I was like, I thought we were like comparing you to Satan. No, 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 I was just, I was just pointing out that like Satan, Satan, Satan likes favorite things too, but they're not him. Okay, well, I love to tell the story of him waiting for those who have been. To tell the story of unseen things of Jesus and His glory, of Jesus and His love, I come to tell.
Revan, I know my Revan had 44. Or 44. So it was, was a good one. It was a good one. Yeah. Hold on, I have to. Touch it. Nothing really matters except what God's word says. I agree with that. I agree with what you just said. That's, that's the deal, but I will tell you what the passage is. I, I want you to know I did read it. I know you did. I know you did. The passage was from Acts. No. You know, missionaries. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Praise the Lord. So I guess that's why the Lord made sure they were scattered. Yeah. Okay. Scattering the seeds. Yeah. Okay. okay, I'm going to have uh, Paul come up here and read God's word as, uh, as we're going to look at and focus on today. This is a parable known as the wheat and the weeds, or the wheat and the tares. I am glad of an alcoholic. Matthew chapter 13. It's found in a bulletin. Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into the barn. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. God bless the reading of God's holy, holy word. Okay. Um, we're, uh, we're in the middle of a series on parables of Jesus, uh, especially as it relates to recovery. And uh, the long and short of it, all of us, all of us need to be in recovery. The only person that's ever lived didn't have to be in recovery was Jesus Christ, because he was perfect. He never had sinned in anything he said, anything he did, or anything he thought. He always did the will of the Father perfectly. Uh, all the rest of us, we're addicted to sin. You know, some of us, you know, our principal thing is alcoholism. Some of us, our principal thing is drugs. Some of our, you know, thing is uh, <coughs> sex. Some of us, it's, um, it's just being right. Some of us have an addiction to anger. We just get, you know, really off on anger. Uh, you know, we, we sang this incredible hymn, this incredible song. It's become one of the, one of the great uh, gospel songs of the uh, 21st, 20, 20th century, 21st century. Uh, Hank Williams wrote this song, I Saw the Light. Uh, Hank Williams struggled all his life with, uh, with uh, sex and, and booze and all kinds of other crazy things. Uh, he had a, lot of, uh, had a lot of pain he dealt with and, you know, he found drugs to, you know, relieve him. He died, he was 29 years old. Imagine, 29 years old. And yet he probably had more influence on, um, on American music even uh, international music. He uh, was very influential on uh, Elvis Presley and the Beatles and a bunch of other folks. Uh, and he 
he became, he really became the one, first uh, American superstar in Queens. Uh, he had a lot of great, great hits. And as a, as a boy growing up in South Alabama, every morning uh, as I ate my eggs, grits, and bacon and toast, uh, the radio would be on, and it would be on a country radio station, and uh, about every third song was by Hank Williams. You're cheating hard, you know, Weeping Willow, Honky Tonkin, all kinds of wonderful, wonderful. But, uh, but this particular song, I Saw the Light, he wrote in, uh, in 1947, he had actually been out and he'd done a concert, and uh, like most of the time that he was uh, living, breathing, he was drinking. And uh, so he had fallen asleep in the back seat of the car, and his mother was actually driving. And uh, at that point, they, they had moved, they were living in Montgomery, Alabama. And so about three o'clock in the morning, as they were approaching uh, the city of Montgomery, Alabama, his mother said, Hank, Hank, wake up. He said, we're almost there. I saw the light. She was talking about it. She saw the, uh, you know, the light there at the, at the airport. You know, those air, back, remember that when they had the airport lights and they went around and, you know, one was green, one was white, and they'd go around and around. And so she saw the, the airport light on Daniel Bill. And uh, shortly after that, he wrote this song. Now he, he grew up like Victor. He grew up going to church as a little boy. He went to a Baptist church in uh, South Alabama as a boy. He heard the gospel. And he, but he struggled all his life. He was, uh, he was a lost soul. You know? But he, he, all, he always seemed to have a hope that somehow he could get relieved. He actually got fired from the uh, Grand Ole Opry because he uh, came home one night drunk. Sad, sad story, and yet, you know, he had this hope. And so, the last several years of his life, every concert he ended with this, uh, this song, I Saw the Light. I Saw the Light. The hope, you know. If it's breathing, there's hope. And uh, I don't know if we'll see, I don't know if we'll see Hank in heaven, but maybe we will know. Because we don't know. We don't know who's going to be there. We don't know who's not going to be there. Uh, my earthly boss used to say, it could be three surprises when we get to heaven. Uh, first surprise is you're there, <laughs> that I'm there. Uh, the uh, second surprise is who else is there? There may be some folks that we didn't expect to be there who were there. <laughs> and then it's going to be the surprise of who's not there. And so the folks, that we think, well, you know, they're just, they're so wonderful, they, they're certainly gonna be there. But our passage this morning has to do with, uh, with that, uh, that whole business about who's gonna be there and who's not gonna be there. It's the uh, parable of the wheat, the wheat and the weeds. The good seed produces, produces that which is good and righteous and wonderful uh, and worth keeping. Bad seed is going to be bundled up and thrown, thrown into the fire. So here's the deal. Uh, Jesus, the, the historical context of, of him telling this particular parable, in fact, he tells several parables, right, one after another. Uh, at the end of chapter 12 of Matthew, uh, Jesus, you know, he's been preaching uh, for some time and they say, hey, Jesus, your mother and your brothers and sisters are here to see you. They want to see you, they want to talk to you. And he looks at his disciples and he says, who are my mothers and brothers? My mothers and brothers are you, those who do the will of the Father. Uh, now, unfortunately, at that point, his uh, brother James, his brother Joseph and his brother Jude, and we don't really know the names of his sisters, but uh, and of course they're his his half brothers and sisters. Uh, they're uh, they were not born of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was, but they were Mary was their mother and uh, Joseph was their father, and so at this point 
they think Jesus is off his rocker because he's going around telling people that he's God. I am that I am. You know? And so they're a little bit concerned. They don't figure out, they don't figure out really who Jesus is until after the resurrection. But after the resurrection, it dawns on them, hey, he, he really is the Messiah. Uh, of course, and we get that wonderful book called Book of James and uh, a very important book for us who are in recovery. And we get that wonderful book of Judah. But uh, at this point, Jesus is talking, he's talking to the crowd, he's talking to those people who are actually listening and getting the point of what he's preaching. So, he, he's preaching to this large group of people, uh, and he, there's so many people there, he has to get in a boat, you know, and uh, so everybody's sitting up there on the, on the shore, so he gets out. And the first parable he tells in chapter 13, let's see if I can get it up here on my wonderful iPhone. The first parable he tells is called the parable of the sower. Now that's a different parable than the parable we're going to look at today. And it's a wonderful parable. It's a wonderful parable, I and mean, we may do that another Sunday. Uh, but then beginning in verse 24, he tells the parable of the weeds. But both of these, uh, both of these have to do with uh, planting seed. Both of them have planting seed. And, and of course, last week we talked about the rich, rich fool, the uh, farmer who, you know, he had his bumper crop. So that, that had to do with planting seed too. Several of, of Jesus' most uh, prominent parables, uh, best known parables, have to do with farming. And uh, I heard a story this is not directly related, but it is, it is also related, so I want to tell the story. Uh, there was this little boy, he was about eight or nine years old, and he told his daddy one day, he said, Daddy, he said, I want to help you plant the beans today. I know you've been talking about planting the beans today. And his dad said, well, are you sure you want to do this? And he said, oh, yes, Daddy. He said, I want to help you. I want to help you plant the beans today. And his dad said, well, you know, it's hard work. The boy said, oh, I'm not afraid of hard work. He said, let me get out there and help him. So the father takes him out to the, to the field there, and he's got the, he's plowed it up, you know, and he's ready, he's ready to, you know, plant. And so he instructs his son, he says, now look, uh, it's, it's plowed here, but the, the soil's kind of soft, and what I want you to do is, I want you to go along, and about every three or four feet, I want you to make a little mound, a little mound, and then I want you to poke a hole in the top of that mound, sort of like poking a hole in a volcano. I want you to poke a hole in that, and I want you to, to take three seeds, I want you to take three seeds out of the bag I'm gonna get you, and put it in there. And then a little, and, and then I've got this little thing of water, and as soon as you put the three seeds in there, cover it up, and I want you to pour a little water on it. And I said, so you're gonna do this? And, and uh, remember, I've got three seeds. Maybe, maybe, maybe two, but maybe three, but no more than that. So the little boy, you know, he's, he's really enthusiastic. And he starts going down. He gets down one row, and he's got a, Two dozen of these little mounds with the two or three beans in each one of them. And uh, by this time it's about 9 30 in the morning, and the sun's come up and it's getting hot and he's getting sweaty. And so he, you know, he starts down the next row and he's making these mounds. And, you know, he reaches in the bag and the bag's full. I mean, it's got lots of seeds in there. So he goes, hmm. I think I'll start putting four in. And so he puts four in, you know, does a row with four. Then, you know, he gets to the third row, and by this time he's pretty exhausted. So, you know, he starts putting a whole handful in, you know, not two or three or even four, but a whole handful in each one of the mounds. Pours a little water in there. 
So he comes in about 12 o'clock and he says, I'm through, Dad. And Dad said, you are? I said, wow, that's incredible. I said, I'm really surprised that you were able to finish this so soon. He said, oh yeah, he said, it's gonna be wonderful. So a week or so passes and the father comes in and says, so I don't want you to come out here and look at the field. Tell me what you think. So the little boy goes out there, the little boy goes, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And the dad says, son, this is a lesson for you. Remember, the beans always come up. <laughs> the beans always come up. It tells us tells. And so <clears throat> this parable that uh, that John read for us, wonderful, wonderful parable uh, that Jesus and and there are only two there are only two parables that Jesus actually explains exactly what's going on. And this is one of them. He explained the one that he told right before this one about the, the parable of the sower. He explained that to the disciples. And he also uh, goes on a little later and explains, he explains what the parable of the weeds and the wheat, or the wheat and the tares. A tear is a weed, okay? All right, so what it says here, it says, and I, I like this uh, in the NIV, it says, it's the parable of the weeds. It's the parable of the weeds, not the parable of the tares. Because who knows what a tear is? You know? uh, but we all kind of have an idea about weeds. It, does anybody have a, a garden or you know, anybody have a, a lawn? Uh, then you have, you have an idea of what a weed is. Uh, there's a weed that grows here called, uh, what's it called? Nutgrass. And it is almost impossible to get rid of. And nutgrass is a good lesson of how we have to, to deal with, with our uh, recovery. Nutgrass is one of those things that comes up, it's a real pretty little, you know, sprout that comes up. And uh, you'll see a sprout, and, you know, put it to a way, you'll see another sprout, but it will take over your yard. But in order to get rid of nutgrass, you have to, you can't just pull the, you can't pull the blades out. Because underneath the ground, there are these roots that go between those, those uh, sprouts, and there are these little nodules, little nuts, uh, that are underground. And so in order to get rid of nutgrass, you have to dig, you have to dig, dig a trench and get to those little nuts and pull the weeds, I mean, pull the, uh, the nuts and the, uh, and the roots out in order to get rid of them. And uh, I, I had an infestation one time in my yard of nutgrass. And uh, so I, I thought, and I thought, well, I'm gonna do a little experiment. Because it's almost impossible to kill this stuff. I put it in a jar. I put this nutgrass in a jar uh, and sealed the jar, completely sealed the jar. And I left it for a couple of weeks. And I went back in there and it was, you can't kill it. It's just, you, know, you have to pull it out. And it's the same thing with uh, you know, with our recovery. You know, you, you gotta dig the you gotta dig all those resentments out, you know. That's the deal. Anyway, so Jesus explains this uh he, well he tells this parable, the parable of the sower. And uh, I'm gonna read it again because it's uh, it's worth reading. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven, and that's what Jesus is all about. He's about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. And he goes out and he plants, he plants the very best wheat. And while everyone was sleeping after he had planted the good wheat, the enemy the enemy came along and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. Now, it could be, it could be now in the explanation Jesus points out, you know, what this uh, is symboli symbolizing, but in the, in the telling of the actual story, it could be that when the, when the farmer talks about the, the 
the enemy, that it could be a, a competing, somebody that's competing with him in farming. That, uh, that some competing farmer comes along and plants some, an evil person comes along and plants some bad stuff in there. Now, I did a little studying of this, and uh, I think it's called Darlin, Darlin, that's what it's called. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a grass type thing that that looks when it first comes up. It looks very, very much like wheat, but as it gets more mature, it's very obvious it's not wheat. Wheat's good for eating, and that other stuff, uh, Dorlin, it's not. Uh, so it could be that some competing person came along and just didn't want this uh, farm to be successful, didn't want him to have a, a good bumper crop, and tried to uh, wipe him out. Sort of like, you know, what happens in, in uh, corporate America. Uh, you know, they, they have these people that, that are evil, they go in and try to do something bad in the competing uh, company. I think both of y'all work for a corporation. They don't ever have that kind of stuff. I've been seeing it. So, uh, anyway, uh, or it's like, you know, if you're in the Army, military, there are uh, people that infiltrate and try to do bad stuff. Do bad stuff. So, it says, uh, this enemy comes along and he can plants weeds. That in and of itself is just an evil thing to do, the idea that you act, actually plant weeds. There's some weeds here in, in, in South Park that I absolutely just hate. Uh, there's, uh, there's one that if you get close to it, these little needles stick to you. I forget what that's called. It's, uh, the only thing it's good for, it, it, it does have a little blossom that, uh, that attracts modern butterflies. So, but as a, uh, as a plant, it's pretty useless otherwise. And, and it's very prolific. I can grow weeds better than I could ever grow anything else in my garden. So, I was able to grow stuff. So he plants these bad weeds, and the owner, you know, the farmer, the big guy, his servants come to him and say, hey, the weeds that are coming up with the wheat. What, 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 what are we going to do about that? And the owner says, just leave it. Leave it until it matures. And when it matures, then we're going to separate the wheat from the weeds. And separate the wheat from the tares. And the same thing happens uh, in another parable about separating the goats from the sheep. I didn't really understand the difference between a goat and a sheep until I lived in, in, uh, in Jamaica. Sheep are something that, that are, uh, they're, they're very domesticated animals and you have to care for them. But goats, they just take care of themselves. Uh, goats are goats are like active alcohol, alcoholics, you know. They just go and do whatever they want to do, you know. And, uh, so, it needs to be a separating of the sheep. And the sheep will actually follow the shepherd. The goats, they just do whatever the hell they want. And so it has to be a separating of the goats and the sheep too. But here the, uh, the owner says very wisely, he said, look, he said, uh, don't pull them, don't pull the weeds out because if you pull the weeds out, you're probably gonna pull the weed out as well. Uh, and they said, well, well, how did this happen? And the, uh, the owner says, an enemy did this. An enemy, somebody that hates us, did this. So he says, uh, leave it until it grows. And then, then when, you, uh, when it matures, then I want you to take and I want you to gather the two of them and separate them at the harvest. Separate that which is good, the wheat, from that which is the weeds, and I want you to take the wheat and I want you to process that, and then later we'll make bread out of the out of the uh, out of the flour that comes from the 
week, but I want you to take the weeds and I want you to bundle them up and I want you to burn them and gather the wheat and bring it and put it in the barn. Bundle it up and throw the weeds into the barn. Mm -hmm. Now, Jesus actually explains this. He actually explains this because later the apostles, it says, then Jesus left the crowd and he went into the house his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds. You know, his, his, his disciples were like, you know, we, we think of the apostle Peter, we think of Andrew, we think of all these apostles, and, and we sort of falsely elevate them to a, a, a place of sainthood. But as disciples, Sometimes they weren't real bright. They didn't act real smart, you know. I'm like, well, we're, we're clueless. What, what, are, what, are, what are you talking about here? Explain this, because we didn't get it, you know. This one we just didn't get it. And so Jesus graciously explains to them what this parable is about. He says, the one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. In other words, he's talking about what he's doing as he's preaching the gospel and planting the seeds of the gospel. Now, the field is the world. I love to tell the story. I love to tell the story all over the world, the global mission of the church. Uh, appropriate for this, uh, this week here at Old Butler. It is global mission. Uh, the one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. In other words, these are the people who are going to grow up and want to serve the Lord, who want to, want to do that which pleases God, who want to become not only believers in God, but people who believe God and obey Him. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. The weeds are the people of the evil one. The enemy who sows, sows his seed is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. And the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire so that it will be in the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, the good angels, not the demons. The demons will you know, be with the be with the unrighteous and be thrown into the lake of fire. Pretty scary stuff. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out his kingdom. Everything that causes sin and all who do evil, they will throw them into the blazing furnace. There, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't know. Um, uh, Russell, I think weeping and gnashing is sort of like being you know, a, a thumb sucking crow to cry, cry I think it's worse than that. Yeah, it, 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 it's a step worse than, it's, it's worse than a thumb sucking crow. It's like what was made. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if y'all remember, but in, in, uh, in Acts, uh, uh, at the, uh, the end of chapter 7 at the end of 8, uh, Stephen, one of the first deacons, preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin it says they didn't like it, that they, 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 they held their ears, you know, they stuffed their fingers in their ears, and it said there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. They weep and they gnash their teeth. I don't know. It's been a while since I was a thumb-sucking crybaby. But, by God's grace, I don't think I've ever gotten to the point of gnashing my teeth. Sometimes it's at night I grind them, but I don't gnash them. Anyway, so, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous. This is the hope we have. This is the hope we have. Then the righteous, those who have believed God and trusted in Him, they will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever 
has ears, let them hear. Now, what this is really talking about is talking about those people who really actually come to a point where they humble themselves, where they follow what it says in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2, the one that I, God the Father, God the Holy uh, Trinity, the one that I, the creator of the universe, the one that I esteem, is the one who has a humble and a contrite heart and trembles at my word. Trembles at my word. There are some people who, you know, they look pretty good on the outside. You know, there's some people that, you know, they just, you, you look at them and say, well, well, he seems to be a good man. And we get to heaven, and that guy ain't there. And he's not, I mean, there, there are people, there are people out there who give millions, billions of dollars away uh, when, they, when they're rich, to all kinds of causes. Now that's a fine thing to do, unless you're doing it for the wrong motive. If you're not doing it for the glory of God, and you do it for the glory of yourself, that ain't going to be honored. And, and here's, here's a, a wonderful illustration. I, I hope that uh, you won't get tired of my stories, but, and, and this is not original with me. I heard this old guy, uh, he was the associate pastor of the church I grew up in, and my wife and I were visiting the church uh, several years ago, and this old man was preaching and he preached a, a sermon on, um, on what it means to trust and obey and no other way in Jesus be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And he told this story, he said, <clears throat> there was a very famous baseball game years ago, there was a very, very famous baseball game. And it was, uh, you know, between these two teams that were, you know, they were very competitive. And, and uh, the two teams that came down to the ninth inning, and uh, there were two outs, and the team that was, uh, that was the, the, the bottom of the ninth, the team that was playing, they were, uh, they were a score behind. They were a score behind. All right, two outs, bottom of the ninth, and this guy who uh, you know, was known to hit home runs steps up to the plate. And the pitcher winds up and he throws strike one, strike two. <clears throat> Finally, he throws the third time, and the guy hit his, hits it right out of the ballpark. I mean, right, totally out of the ballpark, home run. And he takes off running. He takes off running. And he runs around the bases. And as he gets to the home plate, you know, in all of his glory, he, got, he decides that he's going to slide in the home plate. And as he slides in the home plate, the umpire goes, out! He just hit a home run. Out! And of course, they lose. And so everybody's like, why don't you call him out? And the umpire said, he did not touch first base. When he ran around the bases, even if you hit a home run, you have to touch the first base, the second base, the third base, and slide home. He said, and this guy didn't touch first base. First base in Christianity is to have a broken and a contrite heart and to confess Jesus Christ is my only hope of salvation. I have no hope other than him. And if you do that, you know, then you touch first base. You can touch second base. You can become a member of the church. You can become a member of the missions team. You can become a deacon. You might even become an elder. And you can go ahead and touch third base. Maybe you become a missionary and go overseas. And maybe when you retire and you come home, you're going to be saying, you know, Jesus is going to say, I never knew you.
because you never touched first place. Because if you have that trust in Jesus as your only hope of salvation, you're going to be that bundle of weeds thrown into the fire. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that Jesus came to save us sinners. Lord, we need saving. Lord, we pray that we would be like the good seed. That we would not only believe in you, but we would believe you and that we trust and obey. For there really is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. First base is absolutely <laughs> necessary. Uh, um, essential. 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 So, looking at our next hymn, wonderful hymn. Louis Ramson. Right next to Louis Ramson, it's past me now, but we'll see. That's the Savior. Okay, four eight. One of your favorites, right? What? One of my favorites. <laughs> it's terrible. I love them all. 488, just as I am, and the, and the scripture that goes with that is from John 637. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Good news for all of us. Just as I am.
Facebook, <clears throat> or in 30 years watching YouTube that hasn't passed first base yet, touch it. Would you like to pass and touch first base today? Make a decision about Jesus. It's not <clears throat> magic words. It's not a ticket stamp. But just as this hymn says, do you believe and do you want Jesus' blood to be shed for you? Is he calling you? Today is the day of salvation. Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart today. It says, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fighting some fears within the doubt, doesn't mean you got everything figured out, it doesn't mean you don't have questions, but you humbly, you humble yourself and come to Jesus. Are you willing to do that today? He'll, he will receive you, welcome you, pardon you, cleanse you, relieve you, because you believe his promise. Dear Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I want to turn away from my sin, and I can't do it. I don't have the power. I need Jesus in my life. I need the Holy Spirit to come in and give me the power I need to change me, because I can't do it. I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior and ask you to continue to work in my life and draw me into a relationship, a saving relationship with you, so that I can be wheat at the end of the age. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it so much. Okay, well, uh, next week I think we might be doing the uh, parable of the pearl of great price. The pearl of great price. Uh, now, hey, receive the benediction. Now, by the love of God the Father, the grace and truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit be and abide with each and every one of you, both now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.